My name is Shannon Morgan, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. Become a Bigfoot Case Files member today by clicking the join button below this video or on our YouTube channel page. Channel members get access to exclusive perks, including two weekly members-only videos with limited ads, monthly members-only giveaways with exclusive Bigfoot Case Files merchandise, and more. For a full list of all channel member perks, please see the membership tab on our channel page. As always, thank you for all of your support, and we hope to see you there. On May 1, 1985, in Dutchess County, New York. In 1985, my friend and I were driving along Lake Road in Pine Plains. It was late afternoon in spring or maybe early summer. It was a wooded area with very few houses. While driving, we both saw what looked like a large man move from the shadow of a large tree and cross the road in two strides. When we got up to the spot where it crossed into the area of the tall grass near the tree line, I remember looking for the man in the area. I was thinking in terms of a peeping tom, because the man didn't walk along the road. He just seemed to materialize out from the tree, like he had been standing in the shadow of the tree next to the road, out of sight of the house. When I didn't see anyone in the brush or grass, I took note that the figure had appeared light brown when he stepped out of the tree shadow. I also realized that if I crossed the road, it would have taken me at least five strides. The next incident was also late afternoon, a week or two later in the same area. Sitting in a car at exactly dusk, my friend saw a tall brown figure standing along the tree line next to the road, the same side that we were on. There is a large ball field on our left, and a lake beyond that to the west. We were facing north, and then she said, What is that? She didn't say who. I looked ahead, and I couldn't make out what she saw, until I saw movement about 100 yards ahead. That's when I saw a light brown leg turn into the tree line and a tall, upright man walk into it. We decided that we didn't want to sit in the car next to the tree line about 30 seconds after we lost sight of it. We drove the car slowly up to the place that we last saw it, but my friend, who was driving, didn't take her foot off the gas and didn't stop. There was a small shed there in the trees that the ball field uses to store equipment. It is about the size of two outhouses. It certainly could have been hiding behind it. Both times, I can say that the tallness of the figures, using the tree heights as a baseline, were definitely well above six feet. I also have a friend's story. He told this to me after I had told him mine. He said he and another friend were driving his pickup around in a field at about 11 p.m. The truck was bouncing around while they did donuts, burning around in circles in the field. My friend stopped the truck for a minute, and they were laughing with the inside light on, and the headlights were on too. While the truck was at a complete stop, the back end of the truck started bouncing up and down, like someone or something was jumping on it. They didn't want to get out to see what was causing it, so they put the truck in gear and peeled out of the field. This happened around the same time, within a matter of weeks of my sightings. In summer 1985, in Monroe County, New York. At 2 a.m. on a very warm summer night, the main witness, Laura, and three of her friends had planned an evening hanging out, playing music, and generally having a fun time. At some point during the night, the discussion turned to horror movies, ghosts, and specters, and the four girls decided to experiment with an old Ouija board. None of them were really scared by the board, or what could happen. In fact, they had no real idea at all how to even use it, apart from what we had seen in horror movies, said Laura. However, while experimenting with the board, something decidedly odd did occur. On two occasions, the electricity went off, which scared the living daylights out of the four friends. So they decided to stop, even though nothing else weird happened that night. For reasons that Laura admits to this day, she cannot really explain or understand. A feeling of fear and apprehension came over the next day. After her friends had all returned to their respective homes, once again, the electricity failed at about 6 p.m., and the dark feelings started to take an ever stronger hold on Laura's mind. After eating a hastily made sandwich, 
she decided to retire to the comfort of her room. Later that night, Laura was awoken from a deep sleep in the early hours, and she heard what sounded very much like a loud yet disturbing animal-like scream coming from a small, densely packed area of woodland that was at the back of the family home. Cautiously, but curiously too, Laura got out of bed, went to the window, and looked into the darkness. Nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary, so she got back to her bed and was soon asleep again. At about 2 a.m., Laura was jolted from her sleep by what she described as the grossest smelling thing ever, like an old rotting cabbage. Laura turned on her lamp that was next to her bed, and she was horrified by the sight of a silhouetted, large black hairy figure that was in the shadows of her room. She said the creature was hunched over and had huge long arms and big white eyes. She tried to scream when she experienced a feeling of paralysis. I was sitting up, but I couldn't speak or move at all, she said. The hairy creature then slowly moved in Laura's direction, stooped down over her, and brought its face within eight to nine inches of hers. For several moments, this creature stared intently and deeply into her eyes, and then slowly and carefully backed away. The strange form ultimately disappeared, Laura said, like it had been sucked into the shadows. She also noted that though it had certainly scared her, she didn't get the feeling that it was in any way directly hostile. Instead, it was her opinion that the creature had appeared to warn her not to get mixed up with ghosts or Ouija boards again. In 1961, in Walker County, Texas. The incident was on a ranch owned by a local family who had a grocery store in Huntsville, Texas. This is not my sighting, and I don't want my name or any of these names used publicly, but I felt this information might add to the database. About 1960, my husband Teddy, name changed at request of submitter, and two high school friends had an unusual experience in the woods outside Huntsville, Texas. Teddy passed away in 1975 and only told me the story once, shortly after we were married and when he was somewhat inebriated, as the experience was terrifying and not something he or the other boys wanted to be teased about forever in a small town. He was very technical and good on detail, an electronics engineer for Lockheed at NASA, so I believe his story. One of the boy's relatives owned some land with a cabin on the western edge of the Great Piney Woods of East Texas. This is where many legends are based, and some, like the ivory-billed woodpecker, have come true, and some could still be unknown. One of Ted's friends had a ranch on a different creek and used a pack of six leopard dogs around the house to keep his family safe. Anyway, on a weekend night, the boys were bored, and as was custom in small towns, decided to go driving and hang out at the cabin as they had before, knowing that the fridge would be well stocked with soft drinks. They parked the car on the county road as they did not have a key to the gate and walked about three-quarter mile to the house and turned on the lights. The boys were talking and having a good time for an hour or so, but had the feeling that they were being watched from outside, thinking maybe some friends or rivals might have followed them and trying to play tricks on them. They turned out the lights and sneaked out the door from the kitchen window where they thought they had heard the sounds. The night was fairly clear, but there wasn't much moonlight and no outside lights, and they weren't seeing anything unusual as they slowly crept around the cabin to the kitchen window. Through it, they saw the light of the open refrigerator with a six-foot-tall being silhouetted in front of it, apparently drinking a bottle of ketchup. For the years that the family owned the cabin, they thought they had an old hermit living in the woods. Although they had never been close enough to see him, they never found any signs of human habitation, like garbage or anything. They would just see things he might have done, and they had warned people to beware of the hermit. One of the boys yelled, The hermit! Let's get out of here! Quickly, the boys decided to split up, so one group could get help for the others if needed. Ted was the fastest and in trouble with the coaches because he wanted to keep his job selling newspapers instead of running for the high school team. He took an alternate path back to the road instead of the original one he used. Sure enough, as he tore through the brush and trees, trying to find the path in the dark, he heard something coming behind him, and it was running faster than he was. There was a moment when Ted thought all was lost, as whatever was chasing him was so close that he could hear it breathing. 
He could also smell it from 20 feet or more, worse at closer range, and it really stunk, somewhat like a moldy skunk. Then all of a sudden, he was at the road, and the other boys were in the car waiting to pick him up, and they drove off, totally terrified. There was nobody to report this to, without getting themselves in more trouble than they needed, because they weren't supposed to bother the hermit. In retrospect, he said that the thing might have not been chasing him so much as being terrified at the boys yelling, and maybe he had chosen the same path that he had to get away. Ted said he always thought it was a teenage hermit, and when I asked why, he said he just had the feeling that it wasn't an adult, and what else could it be? I asked what kind of clothes it wore, jeans, overall, or anything, and he said he couldn't see the clothes because it was totally covered with long, dark hair, about four to six inches long and he couldn't see a face. Ted was concerned that the hermit might have cut himself while he was trying to copy them drinking a Coke, because apparently he had picked up a small glass bottle of ketchup instead, and the bottle opener was nailed to the wall, and it probably didn't remove the cap. The being's size, smell, and speed were what Ted remembered the most, and he never wanted to remember again, so I didn't ask again, and if he ever told the story to anyone else, I'm not aware of it. Probably the reason it sticks in my memory is that, at the time, it was my first year teaching middle school English, and the school had just received some motivational paperbacks for the kids. These books were so much fun to read as comic books, but had more print and fewer pictures, and featured topics that the kids were really interested in. One was about legendary creatures, such as the Abominable Snowman, and a chapter also covered Sasquatch and Bigfoot. And this was a totally new concept to me. It seems I was told that when the being was entering or leaving the cabin, one time it took the door off the hinges and left through the window, screen or not. In 1968, in Angelina County, Texas. On a Friday night after a date, my girlfriend and I had stopped alongside a heavily wooded dirt road that had been cleared to expand the subdivision where she lived with her parents. The moon was full and the night was very bright, As we talked, I began to feel an odd sensation, as if we were being watched. Apparently, she felt the same thing too, because we both suddenly became very quiet. I turned to look out the driver's side window of my car, and when I looked, I looked straight into the face of a very large, man-like hairy creature, which had hunched down to stare at us. It was about six feet from me. The moonlight shone on the white dirt road behind it, making its silhouette very clear. The oddest thing, as if the creature weren't enough, was that its eyes glowed faintly pale yellow in its dark face. This glow did not appear to be a reflection of moonlight, as the moon was high and to its back. Its shoulders were very broad, and it had no distinct neck, as if the shoulders sloped up to blend into its head. Although stooped on one knee, it was as tall as my car. I noticed all of this in a flash, although I'll never forget it, because I quickly turned back to look at my girlfriend, When her eyes caught mine, she lost it and began to scream bloody murder. That settled it for me. I started the car and I sped away. After I left her safely at her parents' house, I looked up some friends who went back with me to search for the creature. Within an hour, four of us were back waiting on the road. Dogs were barking everywhere. We heard cattle gates being rattled across some fields beyond the woods, but we saw nothing. The next day, a friend and I returned to search for tracks. We didn't find any on the packed sand of the road, but we did find unusual signs in the woods. Most were indistinct due to a covering of pine straw, though. Late in the day, as we walked back onto the road, I got that same eerie feeling again, so I turned to look back into the woods. The sun was setting, and I suddenly saw the creature's silhouette between the pine trees. It was following us, silently. I whispered for my friend to look, and at first, he couldn't see it so he moved back and forth to scan the thicket. The creature mimicked his movements. After it moved, my friend spotted it. Without speaking, we bolted, ran to my car, and drove off. None of us spoke much about it afterwards, although many at our high school heard about it and bothered us with questions. Except for a few friends, I seldom discuss it with anyone, even now. No one would ever believe it. It was late on a Friday night during a full moon with clear skies, and also the following day near dusk. In fall 1930, in Leon County, Texas, two men, lawyer Henry and another fellow, were quail hunting along a fence line near the Trinity River. 
they saw a very large, nine-foot-tall, black-brown creature burst from the very thick brush carrying a calf. The calf must have weighed 300 pounds, and this animal had it in its arms running upright. Needless to say, they departed the area and sped back to their employer, who would like to remain confidential due to his failing health. As dusk approached, the hunters returned to the location to find one dead calf, entrails removed, and brush busted up all around. The three dogs that they brought would not get out of the car, and the opinion was to leave. Not long after this occurred, Mr. Lawyer Henry, his family, and many neighbors left the area. A couple of their houses still stand, although in severe disrepair, and grown up with brush. The area is still remote and on private land. It is a swampy river bottom with numerous stands of pecan trees, very remote, 20 miles from the nearest paved road. For years, the locals and early settlers of this part of Texas always talked about a legend that would steal hogs and cattle and ruin your garden. In 1969, in Ellis County, Texas, two teens encountered an entity very similar to that of the Lake Worth monster. According to one of the witnesses, he and a friend decided to have a picnic on his friend's farm. It was heavily wooded with open pastures and creeks running through it, making it a nice place for an isolated outdoor respite. They drove to the location in the late evening bringing their food, a rifle, and his friend's German shepherd. They sat down to enjoy their meal. As they were eating, the dog began to act strange. It started pacing back and forth and growling. The hair on the dog's neck stood up as it looked towards the pond that they were camping next to and started barking. The primary witness looked around towards the pond and there was an ape-like creature that appeared to be observing them. He did not want to believe what he was seeing. It was an ape-like creature, but it wasn't an ape. It looked like what a very primitive man would look like, but still retaining some ape-like features. It was just getting dark, but not completely. It had its right arm outward and away from the body, holding the reeds to one side, and just appeared to be observing them. It was powerfully built, especially in the shoulder and chest area. It was covered with hair and had no neck. The left arm was hanging down by its side, and it extended to a length below its knees. The teens were completely overtaken with fright. The witness's friend yelled, urging him to get in the car. They grabbed the essential items and raced to the vehicle with the dog close behind. There was a gate to the property, and they had to get out and unlock it before they could leave. They were both apprehensive, thinking that the creature might suddenly appear. They drove as quickly from the area as they could. In the summer of 1960, in Grayson County, Texas, residents of Sherman locked their doors and prepared their weapons as a monster was on the loose. On Monday, July 10, 1960, J. O. Conrad had just gone to bed at 10.30 p.m. when something startled his dog. Conrad was smoking a cigarette when the dog started barking. He looked out the east window and saw him, the monster. He looked to be seven foot tall and about three feet wide across the back. He stood straight up but hunched over. Conrad thought it might be a man, but then realized that it was too tall to be a person. Concerned, Conrad jumped out of bed, grabbed a flashlight and a handgun, and headed towards the front door. Conrad's wife and son James, 13, heard the commotion and quickly rushed to the window where they observed the thing lurking in the moonlight. Conrad went to his front porch and advanced towards the animal, firing at it three times with a twenty two pistol. He knew he hit him at least once, but did not even flinch. Conrad then went to get his shotgun. Miss Conrad phoned the sheriff's office in Sherman and told them of the situation. The deputies warned them against firing at the animal because they were afraid a bullet wound might cause it to attack. Mr. Conrad took heed and didn't try to hit the animal again. He fired the shotgun over his head and he just shuffled off to the east down the highway. Conrad jumped in his car and followed it and got a really good look at it in his headlights when he was following him. He looked black as coal and was really hairy except for his face. Conrad was 20 feet from him when he shot him, and he did not want to get any closer, as he was scared. The creature continued walking upright on two legs, all the way to Blue Creek Bottoms, east of the community. The community began to buzz about the monster, as they compared notes. Miss Curtis Wilson, who lives 100 yards east of Conrad, said that she and her husband were awakened shortly before Conrad saw the animal. 
They heard something rattling in the shrubbery beside their house, and their two dogs were going crazy. They then heard something thump against the house, and the dogs went silent. Mr. Wilson went outside to find the dogs cowering on the porch, and then heard his cows go into an uproar. Conrad's shots rang out, and Mr. Wilson went to fetch his own rifle. By the time he got outside, he couldn't see anything. Resident W.B. Thompson said a man drove into the all-night gas station where he worked, going on about how he saw a large, strange animal along the roadside. Eventually, it was discovered that the animal had been possibly haunting the woods since the 1950s. August 1965, in Marion County, Texas. Johnny Maples, 13, was walking along a rural road near Jefferson when he heard a noise in the bushes. He thought it might be a friend who lived nearby, so he called out. When no one answered, he threw a few rocks into the bushes, figuring it was just a small animal. Suddenly, a large, hairy man or beast emerged from the trees behind a fence, presumably having been hit by one of the rocks. It jumped over the fence and ran towards Maples, who panicked and started running, all the while looking back to see a hairy beast in pursuit. Maples ran as fast as he could, but the creature kept up with him, and he wasn't running either, just sort of walking along behind him. The last time Maples looked around, the beast had gone off the road and could not be seen, but he still could be heard. Maples described it as a seven-foot-tall ape with long black hair all over its body, except for its face, stomach, and palms of the hands. The hands hung down below its knees. Shortly after the Maples incident, Mary Manning and her daughter Rosemary were at the Old Foundry Cemetery on the north side of Jefferson when they heard a loud, guttural growl come from the woods. It sounded like a big animal. The following day, Miss Manning and her husband Herbert returned to the cemetery to have a look around. At the back of the lot, outside the fence, they found a set of huge tracks that led to a small creek in the woods. Thinking that they could maybe lure the animal, they left a pile of green pears beside the path. Four days later, the pears were gone and fresh tracks were visible in the dirt. Several men came out to investigate the tracks, including Keith Thompson of Marshall, who cast them in plaster. The tracks were not extremely large, but they were curious enough to preserve. Marion County Deputy Sheriff Bill Freese assumed that they were small bear tracks until he actually saw them. They did not appear to be that of a bear. The creature that chased Maples became known as the Marion County Monster. While all the investigators were there, Bubba Turner, a man who lived near the cemetery, came down and told them that his cattle were all in a bunch the day before. He said they'd do that the he said they do that when they are scared. Turner decided to look around and eventually walked down a path that led to a creek. There, he spotted two large black figures of some sort. He was too afraid to approach them, so he ran back to his house and watched them until they disappeared down the trail. In 1916, in Cass County, Texas. In Knight's Bluff, west of Queen City, a witness saw a strange ape-like thing near their home. They were traveling home late at night in a mule-drawn wagon when they heard a strange noise coming from across their pasture, something like an eerie, high-pitched wail or howl. The mules heaved nervously as the family looked across the moonlit field to see what made the noise. After a few minutes, they saw a tall figure emerge from the line of trees and walk into the moonlight. It was taller than a man and covered with long, dark hair. It stood absolutely erect and walked slowly towards them like a man, not slouching like an ape. The creature advanced across the field towards the wagon as it continued to howl all the while, motioning angrily with its arms. The father grabbed a rifle and fired at it. At this, it ran back into the woods. This was on Lake Texarkana, now known as Wright-Patman Lake. In May 1938, in Ellis County in Texas. As told to me numerous times by my father, now deceased, when he was a young man of 18, while on a coon hunt, he and three others encountered what I now believe was a Bigfoot-type creature. The witnesses were, as I said, coon hunting. It was night, and they had set up a campfire and waited for the coon dogs to sniff out a coon. After about a half an hour, they noticed that the dogs were not barking or carrying on as coon dogs do when they find a coon. In fact, the dogs did not leave the men's sides. They were really close by the fire and acting kind of scared. 
about that time, they noticed a huge, white-haired figure standing about 30-so yards from the fire. It was just standing there, watching them. Now my father, who lived and hunted in the area all his life, had never encountered such a creature before, as of the rest of the men. They did not stand around to see what the creature would do. They got out of there as fast as they could. They told other people what they saw, and of course, no one believed them. Actually, one man who lived in the bottoms, as what my father called them, said that he heard very strange screams come from the bottoms, most of the time only at night. This occurred around 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. I remember my father telling me that they had to go through some heavy brush on the Red Oak Creek to get to the area where the encounter happened. I know that this sighting that I am telling you happened a long time ago, but I thought I would tell you about it anyways. My father was a very honest man who was also a Bible thumper, and I know his story to be true. I was interested in the subject of Bigfoot for a long time, and my father told his story to me many times. I remember reading about a white Bigfoot in the Lake Worth area back in 1968 to 1969, and it sounds like the same creature that my father saw. I don't know if it was seen again since then. I do have another story about my father's brother, who went back up there to see if he and some friends would encounter the creature, and they did have an encounter with it. Along the banks of the Navidad River at Beatty Point in Jackson County. At the same time, sweet potatoes and corn began to disappear from area fields. Early Texans on the river bottoms near Edna were baffled. Was it Native Americans, a runaway slave? or maybe even some kind of strange creature? No one seemed to have the answer then, and the questions still baffle historians today. That's the way the legend of the wild men of Navidad began, or wild woman, depending on which version of the stories people tend to believe. Eventually, even pigs came up missing, and legend has it that the mysterious character would even go into houses in the middle of the night and steal half of what was found from the cupboards, Jackson County Judge Harrison Stafford says that it's been more than 150 years since whatever it was roamed this part of Texas. These days, there is little talk about the stealthy character. Some of the older folks still talk about it, and we usually have something about him every year in the parade. But other than that, all we know is what we can read in the books. What may be the most complete recap of the legend is chronicled in a historic report written by Ira Thomas Taylor, who served as a school superintendent in the 1930s. Taylor championed the wild men theory, and even went as far to say that the man was eventually captured and died in Victoria County. The other in-depth journal of the legend came in 1938, when Texas folk author J. Frank Doby published his book, Tales of Old Time Texas. Doby concluded that the phantom figure had to be a woman, because several well-documented sightings said it had long, flowing hair, and facial features more like a woman than a man. But no matter who or what the notorious bog dweller was, enough information has survived this day to uphold at least portions of a folk legend. One report was that the wild man arrived in Jackson County after escaping a slave transport ship in Galveston in the early 1830s. According to Taylor's book, he escaped with a gun and a knife and crossed the Brazos and the Colorado before setting into the bottoms of the Navidad because of its abundance of fruit and wildlife. First signs of the footprints came in 1834 and were fairly active for two years. At first, there were reports of three sets of footprints, sparking speculation that the man may have had a woman and a child with him. But Taylor said no official sighting of them was ever reported. The Reverend Samuel C. A. Rogers, a circuit recruiting minister in the area, was quoted in Taylor's account as saying that he first saw the three prints in the spring of 1845 and continued to spot them for several years before all but the largest disappeared. A few years after that time, Rogers wrote in his journal, a hunting party near Morales found a peculiar pile of leaves and sticks covering a skeleton of a man. Rogers said he spent many nights trying to catch a glimpse of the wild man, but never saw anything else. In Taylor's interpretation of the story, he said the first time the wild woman idea began to surface was in the latter 1840s, after the man's body was found. In that decade, Rogers said the strangest episodes of the wild man saga were reported. In the fall, about the time to butcher hogs, the wild man would creep onto farms and ranches, take the flattened pig and replace it with a smaller lean one. 
No one could figure out how a man or a woman would get past fierce dogs while carrying a pig and get away with it. Another account Taylor reported was the wild men's affection for knives and saws. People throughout the area told of times when their saws and knives mysteriously disappeared, only to reappear weeks later, shined and sharpened to perfection. In 1842, Rogers reported that a traveling cowboy found a camp with a workshop, a snare, a Bible, and many stolen tools from the area. Rogers wrote that in 1850, the largest hunt for the wild men was organized, and the hunters did trap a man in a tree, surrounded by baying dogs, horses, and men with guns. They told him to come down, but he would not understand, so one of the hunters climbed the tree and brought him down, Rogers wrote. They kept him in jail for some time, as news of the capture reached all over the country and into Europe. He must have been one of the most famous men of his time after that. While in captivity, a trader, who reportedly spoke of the African dialect of the wild man, talked with a jailed man and reported that he said he seen a son of a chieftain in Africa and was sold to slave trader Monroe Edwards for a knife and tobacco. When he arrived in Texas, he escaped with a companion and made his way to the Navidad Bottoms. He said he was able to get into the houses at night and steal supplies because his tribe knew of certain hours in the night when dogs would not awake when they heard sounds. The story says he was eventually sold in Victoria as a slave to P.T. Buckford and given the name Jimbo. He was later sold to Sebron Lewis in Victoria. He was freed after the Civil War and reportedly died in 1884 on a ranch along the San Antonio River. Dobie's main dispute with the wild man theory comes from two different angles, a reported sighting of the woman and the fact that the old slave caught in 1850 was not capable of the acts of stealth and strength that had been reported to have been accomplished. Dobie describes in his book a near capture of the wild woman during an intensified hunt for the creature in 1846. Presently, the breaking of small sticks and the hurried rustling of the brush near the lasso men announced the approach of something. A minute later, it bounded with a light and flying step into the open prairie in the bright light of the moon. It was the wild woman. She ran directly across the prairie in the direction of the main forest. The man nearest her rode a fleet horse and it needed all the speed it had to keep up with the object of pursuit. As the figure neared the dark woods, the rider was able to throw his rope. But as the rope neared the woman, the horse shied away and the rope fell short. The figure darted into the woods, never to be seen again. Dobie said one fact had been gained from the event. The rider, who had almost roped the fleeing figure, said it had long, flowing hair that trailed down to almost its feet and wore no clothing. He said her body seemed to be covered entirely by short brown hair. As she fled to the woods, she dropped a club to the ground that was about five feet long and polished to a wonder. Dobie added, Dobie added, of course, all of this happened many years ago, and in the telling, you can always guarantee some buildup of the information will take place. If these things did happen, I cannot explain how, Dobie said. In 1969, in Hunt County, Texas, Kenneth Wilson was hanging out with three friends around 11 p.m., as he sat in his car, his friends, one man and two women, were out walking along the river. Wilson heard something moving in the bushes around him. Then a short time later, he heard his friends start screaming. They rushed back to the car in a panic, saying they had seen something down by the river. Frightened, Wilson drove the group to a nearby gas station, where their friend Jerry Matlock worked. They asked to borrow his gun. Not wanting to part with the gun, Matlock accompanied them back to the area to investigate. When they arrived, they were greeted by a shocking sight. A huge, man-like creature, covered with brown hair, jumped over the river and ran towards their car. This thing was bigger than anything that Matlock had ever seen. You could have stretched a three-foot yardstick across its shoulders, and his shoulders would have still been wider than that. Wilson also got a glimpse of the creature. It was big and hairy, whatever it was. At this point, he hit the gas pedal and spun the car around. As they sped off, the man in the front passenger seat tried to shoot at the beast with his gun, and it would not fire. The next day, Matlock and Wilson returned to the scene where they found footprints. He put his arm down in one of the prints, and the print was as long from his elbow to the tip of his finger. July 1969 in Palo Pinto County, Texas 
A 14-year-old boy was in an area only accessible by water on the Brazos River. He was one of a party of 20 campers and two counselors on a three-day, two-night canoe and camping trip down the river. They put in just below the dam, and as they were setting up camp, one of the campers spotted some type of unknown animal peering down at them from atop a 30-foot cliff. The next morning, the boy's canoe and tent buddy told him that he had seen the animal. The first boy knew a way to get up the cliff face, and they were on top in no time and could hear something running off through the woods. They immediately gave chase, and the first boy was in the lead. There were some large boulders lying around, and he ran around one of the larger ones, but as he ran around it, he ran smack into a rather large tree, which knocked him flat back on his rump. He was crumpled at the base of the tree and dazed. When his eyes focused again, he noticed that this tree had hair. He looked up, and the creature screamed, and the boy literally peed in his pants. The friend screamed, it screamed, the boy screamed. It screamed again, and all of this in quick and distorted time. The boys were in a blind panic and ran right off the edge of the cliff. The boys had said that they had run into a giant gorilla. Everybody thought that they were crazy and had made everything up. When the boy ran into it, he only saw from the waist down, and it was covered in dark, almost black hair. In 1933, in Ellis County in Texas, a frightening wild man was seen outside a schoolhouse. It was a heavily wooded area, and there had been several sightings of a wild man. One afternoon, when the children were having recess outside of the one-room schoolhouse, Two of the boys ran back inside, screaming in terror. They told the teacher that they had seen a big, hairy man lurking at the edge of the woods. The teacher, realizing that this was no joke, quickly ushered all of the students back into the schoolhouse and locked the door. After frantic discussions, two of the older boys volunteered to go for help. There was no phone, so this required them to run bravely on foot to the town. While the boys were gone, the teachers and students could hear thrashing, screaming, and ranting from the woods. By the time help arrived, whatever had been there was gone. In 1927, in Marion County, Texas, Richard Eason, conducting a train through rural Marion County, stopped at a telephone house to call ahead. When Eason opened the door to the telephone house, he caught a glimpse of something standing in the flickering firebox light of the train's oil-burning engine. It appeared to be a giant ape or gorilla standing on its back feet with its arms raised and teeth bared. Eason was so frightened that he retreated back to the engine where he told the engineer and fireman what he had seen. Neither man would get off the train to investigate. In the late 1950s, Floyd Fry was at Grapevine Lake, only 20 miles north of Lake Worth. Floyd was 8 years old at the time and was picnicking with his family. He had no playmates, so was just wandering around on his own. Eventually, he found some giant footprints in the sand. He had gone further away from his parents than he had thought. The footprints came from the tree line, crossed an open area of freshly cleared land, and then disappeared into the trees on the other side. They were huge, bare footprints, and were too big to be those of a man. Floyd thought that they were footprints of a giant and followed them into the woods, along what appeared to be a game trail. Eventually, he became too frightened and ran back to his parents, who were still enjoying their picnic. He told them what he had found, but they brushed it off. In summer 1969, in Harrison County, Texas, Charles Faison, who grew up on the west side of Caddo Lake, was with his brother, sleeping in their treehouse, when Charles was awakened by noises around midnight. He figured it was the usual night critters, sniffing around, but decided to have a look anyways. As he peered between the wooden slats of the crude treehouse, he was shocked to see a tall, upright animal standing a short distance away. Charles quickly awakened his brother. They were sitting there, looking at this thing, when it started to come up towards them. It walked to where they had thrown some leftovers from dinner and reached down to scoop them up. Then it looked directly at them. For a few tense minutes, the boys remained frozen, wondering what this animal would do now that it was aware of their presence. But after a few moments, it took off into the woods at an incredible speed. The boys could hear limbs snapping as it ran. They did not sleep the rest of the night in case the creature came back. 
The next day, the brothers found several large footprints left in the soft mud. The creature had five toes, with a uniquely larger big toe, and although they looked human, they were decidedly not. The boys did not have a ruler, so they compared the size to their own feet. Charles estimated that they were 16 inches long. Judging by the height of the treehouse and the position of where the creature was standing, it must have stood over seven feet tall. It made no noise during the encounter, but the boys had heard strange howls that they could not recognize coming from the swamp. In 1969, at Lake Worth, Texas, John, his wife, and two other couples, witnesses in a car, saw a hairy creature that resembled a satyr that pounced onto the hood of the car with six people in it. The creature was covered with scales as well as fur, and it looked like a cross between a man and a goat. The attack left scratches. The three couples raced to the Fort Worth police station and reported the matter to the police. The police sent four patrol cars to the site and saw an 18-inch long scar running through the side of his car. All of the witnesses stated that they had never seen the scratch before. Two days later, on the 11th of July, almost exactly 24 hours later, Jack Harris was driving on the only road leading to the Lake Worth Nature Center when he spotted the same creature crossing the road in front of him. The man-beast ran up and down a bluff and was soon being watched by 30 to 40 people who had come to the area to see it. After the Fort Worth Star-Telegram headlined a story entitled Fishy Man-Goat Terrifies Couples Parked at Lake Worth. Within a short time, sheriff's officers were also there and observing the same creature. When it appeared that the onlookers were getting too close, the man-beast fired a spare tire complete with rim at them, and they jumped back into their car. The seven-foot-tall hairy creature was estimated to weigh 300 pounds, walked on two feet, and had grayish-white hair. It also made a pitiful cry like something was hurting it. The man-beast was seen to throw that tire and rim more than 500 feet. The creature was high up on a bluff and apparently annoyed by the car loads of witnesses who were looking for it. In 1965, in Red River County, Texas. Larry Jagiers was hanging out on the bank of the Red River with friends one night when he had to relieve himself. He walked into some nearby brush and was proceeding to do his thing when he noticed a pair of red eyes looking at him. He also smelled a horrible smell. He called out, thinking it was one of his friends trying to scare him, but there was no response. He quickly zipped up and walked towards the eyes. As he did this, the eyes moved from behind the brush. At that point, he could see a large, bipedal creature that stood at least eight feet tall. He turned and ran for the safety of his friends. They did investigate, but they found no trace of the animal. In 1964, in Polk County in Texas. When I was approximately 10 years old, I went with my best friend Doug and his mother to a small cemetery in the big thicket east of Livingston. Doug had a little brother who died at birth and was buried there. His mom had asked if I wanted to go with them to visit the grave. Just after she had finished putting some flowers on the grave and saying a little prayer, we were turning back to go to the car when we heard something crash at the edge of the woods. We looked back and saw a large, dark, hairy creature standing right behind the back fence of the cemetery, maybe 50 yards away. Miss Jones screamed and the creature gave a loud grunt and shuffled back into the woods kind of a half waddle, half trot. Miss Jones told us to get in the car, which we did. Doug said she never went back to the cemetery again. It was Pine Forest in the East Texas Big Thicket, plenty of creeks nearby. November 1969, in Lake Worth, Texas. At 2 a.m., Charles Buchanan was sleeping in the back of his pickup truck when he suddenly woke to see a tall, hairy creature towering over him. The man-beast seemed to be a cross between a human and a gorilla. The creature jerked Charles to the ground, who was still in his sleeping bag and gagging from the stench of the beast. Charles, in his desperation, grabbed a bag of leftover chicken and shoved it into the creature's face. The creature grabbed the bag from him and, with his long arms, took the sack into its mouth. It then made some guttural noises and then loped off through the trees, went into the water, and swam towards Greer Island with powerful strokes. In July 1969, in Lake Worth, Texas, 
After the 10th of July, parties of searchers, many carrying guns, descended onto the area around Lake Worth, usually at night, and many stated that the man-beast resembled a big white ape. Tracks were also found that were 16 inches long and 8 inches wide at the toes. On one occasion, searchers fired on the beast and insisted that they follow the trail of blood and tracks to the edge of the water. On another occasion, three men insisted that the creature leaped onto and jumped off only after the car collided with a tree. Other witnesses stated that they heard the beast and also smelled it as it was associated with a foul odor. In 1965, in Gregg County, Texas, there was a rash of reports of a giant hairy creature roaming the thickets and back country between Jefferson and Longview. A man and his little daughter reported it as large, black, and not a bear. Several head of cattle and a couple people were supposed to have been killed by it. Private Jacobs was a member of a posse that hunted the creature when he was a teenager. He saw the body of one of the murdered people and that the victim had been torn apart. At the time, he threw his gun back in the car and went home. If you enjoy our content, please be sure to subscribe to our channel, like and comment down below, and follow us on social media. The links are in the description of this video and on our channel page. Also, if you've had an encounter and would like your story told here, please email us at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. As always, we look forward to hearing from you, and thank you for listening.